Well, lecture exam three is in class. You show up, you, look, you walk around the room, look for your picture card, same as lecture exam one. Let's see, lecture exam three, there are 60 questions. Your first couple of exams have 50, there's 60. I say that because sometimes students, they go up to 50 and they stop. But, uh, okay, do you not know, there's 10 more. So I want to make very clear, how many questions? And there's also a written part, just like the last time. So you can expect that for Friday, okay? And it's the same drill as lecture exam one. You walk in, I give the first about an hour and a half for uh, take the exam, take a break. We come back, we'll start the next unit, which is uh, nervous tissue. So that, that'll be Friday, though. But today I want to uh, finish up muscle here. All right, first definition, a motor unit. The definition is one motor neuron plus all the muscle fibers it innervates. And there's a picture of it. Definition, it's the one motor neuron and all the muscle fibers it innervates. That's the unit. So we're talking about more than one cell, right? You have one cell, the motor neuron. And then you have many more muscle fibers. Okay? And so basically, um, the picture, maybe you don't understand it yet because we haven't had the nervous system. But um, the spinal cord was about you know, this long, okay, about a foot and a half. And it's a segmented core. And at each segment, you issue a pair of spinal nerves that come off the spinal <coughs> cord. And the, the motor neurons innervate the muscles so they can work. And so basically, they're showing you one segment of a spinal cord. There's a little central canal in it. It's got these gray horns. <coughs> Anyways, the motor neuron, the cell body is in this ventral horn right there. The cell body of the motor neuron. I'm going to draw a little cell body there. So it lives inside your spinal cord. However, to innervate the muscle, it has to um, you know, send an axon, which is, is a specialized process. It's usually myelinated. And it's going to innervate many muscle fibers. Say, I'll, I'll draw some. So say each of these cylindrically shaped shells is, is a muscle fiber, and it, it may innervate a few of them. So maybe I'll have an axon terminal on this one, and let's say this one too. Let's say this one three. So what we would say is, the innervation ratio is like, it's like a one to three innervation ratio. Does that make sense? What's the one? The motor neuron. What's the three? The muscle fibers. And so the concept to understand, when you recruit a motor unit, you get the whole thing. It's all or none. That's an important concept for today. Motor unit recruitment is all or none. You 
recruit it, you, you use it or you don't. Now, I've only drawn one motor unit. The picture has two. It has that red one and the purple one. Let me draw another one. So, um, draw another cell. <coughs> Maybe this green one innervates this fiber and then this fiber there. Okay. So it's all about um, you know the, the force you have to generate. If you have to lift a load um, and you need a certain amount of force, usually how it works is you recruit the smaller ones first because they're the easiest to stimulate. So you have to think about the cell body of the neuron. It's the neuron that's making your muscles work. So you have to think about stimulating the green cell or the red cell. Now on purpose, I drew the green one smaller as a smaller cell body. Just based on, I don't know, intuition, which one do you think is easier to stimulate? The red one or the green one based on the cell body size? green because it's smaller. It takes less of a jolt to make a smaller cell fire and action potential. So you recruit the smaller motor units first and most frequently. That's kind of the general rule. Rule. Rules are good. Let's see, recruit. Uh, smaller. Recruit smaller motor units. <coughs> frequently. So you have to, I don't know, lift a small a little thing here. It doesn't require much force. Okay, so I just recruit this one first. I keep recruiting the same one. And every time you, you recruit the green motor unit, both muscle fibers fire. You get the whole thing. That's the all part. It's not like you can halfway recruit it and get one muscle fiber to fire and not the other one. It doesn't work that way. You get the whole thing, the whole motor unit. Now, let's say I got to lift a heavier load and the green one isn't enough. So then what? I go, I try harder, you know, more effort, and I recruit both of them. And so I get all the green, all the red, and all of these fibers to generate more force. And hopefully it's enough to, to move the load. So that's the rule there. And today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, you know, factors that influence the, the velocity and duration of contraction of these fibers. So I have to talk about all the different fiber types and um, how you load them. So the last lecture I was focusing on the structure of a muscle fiber and I mentioned how the sarcomere is the smallest structural unit. Now I'm saying the motor, um, the motor unit is the smallest functional unit of muscle. Okay, so make that distinction. Today is all about the motor units. And here's a real histological picture um, next to kind of what we've been drawing. And the classification of motor units, you have to think about the different fibers. And so let me kind of define all that. unit classification. So, so far I just defined it. It's the motor neuron and all muscle fibers and innervates, but there's different kinds of them. And um, what, what you see here is you can classify motor units two ways based upon speed of, uh, speed of contraction. Two ways based upon 
speed of contraction. <coughs> well, to relate this to something you learned last time, it's the muscle twitch. How do they twitch? Are they fast twitch or are they slow twitch? Right, fast, slow. So think muscle twitch. Is it fast or slow? You can also cat categorize three ways based upon uh, metabolism, the metabolic characteristics. Three ways based upon metabolic <coughs> characteristics. There, there, there's a range. It can either be anywhere from all aerobic to, to all anaerobic. Oxygen. This metabolism depends on other things like uh, we need glycogen as a fuel source. Okay. Um, glycolytic. That's kind of the range. And then in between, some cells, they could be both. They have both the oxidative, well, they have the aerobic and anaerobic. So um, the range is on one end, your oxidative, right, O2. Oxidative. And then on the other end of the spectrum, your glycolytic or your both. Methods, these two ways, these three ways to classify motor units, they, they came about like in the 70s. That's when this work was done. Prior to that, so like in the 50s, the way they classified muscle is how the muscle appeared on fresh dissection. It was, it was kind of red or white. And that's kind of an antiquated way to do it because we know this now, but the, the terminology is uh, still used. And um, well, basically, on this end of the spectrum, the muscle appears red due to the myoglobin, increased myoglobin uh, content. More pale and white on this end of the spectrum. So red and white, if you ever see those terms. So it refers to, but I'm going to move on. And um, so let's kind of look at fiber type. So you consider motor unit classification a lot of the data has to do with the fiber type. Okay. And I think the slide that can really help you do it is this one here. Okay. But before I move away from this slide, there's something on it I want to point out to you. In terms of the speed of contraction, you need to think about the simulations that we talked about the last time. Because we did twitch responses. Right? We didn't do fatigue curves, but um, pretty much those are really interesting. It's a really interesting experiment. You biopsy the fiber. You don't know what it is. Nothing's labeled. I mean, you have to do experiments to figure it out. So they, they literally twitch the fiber, and they just stimulate it for an hour. And they want to see how long it can twitch without, you know, um, getting t without fatiguing. They call that the fatigue curve. And we studied one twitch and its characteristics. But a fatigue curve is, okay, well, let's see how um, hard this thing can twitch for an hour. And it's called a fatigue curve. In terms of metabolism, you have to think of your cell biology. If you're an oxidative cell, that means you're going to contain a lot of mitochondrial, um, mitochondria and mitochondrial enzymes. 
I think up here on this end, mitochondrial enzymes. Uh, what I'll give to you today is SDH, succinic dehydrogenase seven. Just remember SDH. It's a mitochondrial enzyme. If you're on this end of the spectrum, you're not going to have mitochondria, but you'll have a lot of the enzymes that um, function in glycolysis. So on this end of the spectrum, um, cells that are anaerobic have a lot of glycolytic <coughs> enzymes. Add to that there. All right. And also, well, I already gave mention to the thing at the bottom of the slide, the neuron cell body size. Basically, what we said was it's easier to stimulate smaller cells. Okay. Well, anyways, here's really the data you should study. Okay. In one slide, it's all here. Now, these data slides, they're hard to see as a presentation. I'll kind of draw it on the board. But there's three fiber types that you need to know for this exam. Type 1, type 2A, type 2B. And so let's kind of talk about the twitch response and the fatigue curve for each of them. And they show you a picture of the motor unit right next to the data. So the motor units with type 1 fibers, one type, type 1. These are sometimes called slow twitch. They just call them based upon the twitch response. These would be, you know, the red muscle. Muscle with these, like I say on the slide, they're slow to fatigue and they're slow oxidative. Oxidative metabolism is a much slower process. That's why I'm um, going to call that. So I'm going to write that. So there's slow twitch. Everything about them is slow. Slow to fatigue. Uh, slow oxidative. These, the innervation ratio is lower. You know, look what they draw. They draw a motor neuron innervating just two fibers. So these are kind of like um, the smaller muscles that you use often, like the muscles in your hand. Okay, that will tire out. Low innervation ratio. So the neuron cell bodies, they don't show it there. It, it, it would be smaller. Okay, so it, these would be recruited first and most frequently. Um, Small neuron cell body. The twitch response is very weak, 10 grams over time. And look at the time, the time in milliseconds here. Uh, they put 200 milliseconds at the end to give you a frame of reference. And these draw a very low curve like that. So uh, they're very slow twitch. I guess 200 milliseconds in terms of a twitch response is very slow. And uh, they don't generate much force, far less than 10 grams. Now, the thing about them that um, I think unique is their twitch response. So this is the twitch response. This is twitching at one time. And whatever that value is, that's 100%. Okay, that, that's what it can do. But let's see how long it can maintain this. Okay, this, this 100%. So this is the fatigue curve that I mentioned. Let's twitch it for two, four, six minutes. And they put a break in the uh, x axis there and they go out to 60 minutes. And what they see, well, I mean, if you could, <coughs> I'm 
talking about this right there. So they, they just twitch it out. And usually when I, when I see these, they, they show all these vertical lines. Each line represents a twitch. Okay. And what they see is like, you're pretty much at 100% for the first six minutes. You just don't get tired. Okay. You should keep going and 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 going. And then, okay, so then it's like, okay, let's go get a cup of coffee and let's come back and see what the hell he's doing. And you come back, there's barely any drop off there after 60 minutes. Maybe it drops off just a smidge. So what we learned about this is, oh, okay, these are slow to fatigue. They don't fatigue, basically. Right? So any questions on the type 1? Type 1 fiber. You appreciate type 1 when you kind of look at the type 2s, yeah. two types of type 2s. There's type 2A and B, so they're kind of similar to each other. Um, the 2As, they're kind of a hybrid of 2B and 1. Okay. Uh, they're called, they're fast, fatigue, resistant. One property. resistant, what does that mean? It means, they, it means they fatigue fast, but then they kind of resist the fatigue. I'll, I'll, when we look at the fatigue, then you'll see that. Uh, other properties is they're fast oxidative glycolytic fibers, FOG for short. Fast, this is their metabolism. Oxidative glycolytic. Now, oxidative metabolism is slow, but the reason why they use the term fat <coughs> is because, well, they also have a healthy amount of um, glycolytic metabolism. So if you ever see the term FOG, it's referring to the type 2 A's because of this reason. And basically, well, um, this muscle will be like a pale uh, pink color, and um, the neuron cell bodies well, they're larger than type 1s, okay? Larger <coughs> cell bodies, and basically, you, have, you increase the innervation ratio. So these are kind of, it's like I'm giving you the terms first, before I show you the data, okay? Usually it's reverse. You look at the data and then you come up with these characteristics. I'm, I'm doing it in reverse, okay? Um, so let's kind of look here. I'm gonna turn my mic up just a little bit here. They're faster, so they finished twitching by 100 milliseconds. What was it for type 1s? It was 200. They're slower. These are faster. And also they generate more force. That peak there is 20 grams. So they kind of, the waveform looks like that. They're stronger, they're faster, okay? That's one twitch. And when you twitch them for an hour, first two, four, six minutes, then out to an hour, 60 minutes. 
here's our, you know, this is our 100%. And so they, they twitch. And notice that they start to fatigue after the first few minutes. There's a significant drop off when you get to minute six there. So I'm drawing up here, it might be hard to see that. So it kind of like drops off significantly. And then you get out to an hour. They're still twitching, but they've dropped off quite a bit more. So they have fatigue, but they're resisting it because it's not zero. So that's why they're fatigue resistant. Even after an hour, they've significantly dropped off. But they're still twitching something. So it's like, kind of like that, right? So they drop off a lot, and they drop off quite a bit more. Um, so that's why they're called fast fatigue resistant. They fatigue fast after a few minutes, but then they resist the fatigue because they still are going after an hour. Okay. Uh, yeah, because why? Why can they do that? They twitch strong for the first couple of minutes because they have um, a glycolytic metabolism and um, their innervation ratio is higher. Okay. And they can resist the fatigue because they have some properties that are um, oxidative. So they can resist the fatigue. All right. So I've done two fiber types. I'm going to do a third one. Are there any questions on the first two? One and two A. Let's do two B. So the two Bs, um, they're, they're the strongest, but they're fast fatigable. Means what it says, they fatigue fast. Their metabolism is also fast, they're glycolytic. Fast, glycolytic. They have, they're gonna have the largest neuron cell bodies. They're the most difficult to stimulate. Large neuron cell body. They basically have the highest innervation ratio. They'll be kind of um, they're the muscle that, that appears white, whitish color in. Uh, well, they're the strongest, so 50 grams, 100 milliseconds, and they, they twitch the strongest. So their twitch response is most impressive. They're the strongest. However, they, they really fatigue super fast. And so um, the fatigue curve. There's 100%. 2, 4, 6 minutes, all the way up to 60 minutes. You can see on the data, there, there's a huge drop off before the first two minutes. Drops all the way down. They're basically fatigued pretty much at six minutes. And you go out for an hour, and you, you kind of look. There's nothing there. <laughs> uh, Go out to an hour, they're basically done. They're not they're done doing anything. Okay, they fatigue after the first uh, few minutes. Glycolytic metabolism, it just you just wear out, you just use all the energy molecules, <coughs> all the fuel sources gone. You don't have mitochondria to sustain cellular activity, they fatigue. Okay. So here, here's the data um, on your half sheet number one. Call it number one ABC on your half sheet. 
take some time to process and identify the fiber type based on the data. <coughs> number one, A, B, C, and put the correct fiber type next to it. What do you put for A? 2B would be correct for A. What is this one? This is 2A, this is 1. So the biggest difference is between the 1s and the 2s, type 1 and type 2s. And it's kind of like 2A, 2B, because like you can train, well if you're an athlete, the type 2s are, are trainable. Uh, say for example, you run the 100 meters. Okay, that's your event. You think. Uh, which fiber type do you think dominates a sprinter? 2B. The fast one. you got to run for like you know, 11, 12 seconds. Well, anyways, let's say your coach thinks, you know, maybe you'd be better 400, 800 guy. Okay? And you change your training. And you can kind of change the metabolic profile of a 2B to become more like a 2A. And maybe you do better in that event. So the point is, the, the type 2s are the, are the most trainable. But the type 1s, you can't really change them to a type 2 profile. The metabolic profile is too different, and the innervation ratio is too, too low. Okay. All right, so let's move on. I'm always impressed. I, around this season, I, I kind of officiate track meets here. And the Bieber Relays is this weekend. Anyone on the track team? No, I, sometimes I have athletes. Wait, there's this event called the Steeplechase. You know, you know what that is? I forget how many laps are on the track. But every time you go around the track, you got to jump over the steeple. Maybe you've seen it on TV. Now, the thing about that is, you know, jumping is a, is a type 2B thing, right? Jumping, like slam dunking a basketball, having the ability to jump. What fiber type is that? to jump, 2B. Now, what do we know about them in terms of fatigue? They fatigue. Now, you run around the track one time, your 2Bs are already fatigued, but then you have to jump. And it's like, it's very grueling. So how do they do it? It's just the will of the athlete to win. And you know, I kind of stand right there where I appreciate, and someone always kind of just, they just kind of bite it. And I feel bad for them because they fall on their face in this big water pit. But I totally get it. Like, they got to jump over this thing. They have to. And they're just sucking wind. It, it's, you know, that's why sports are fun to watch, right? Not when they mess up, but you can really cheer for the guys who can do it. Or, you know, what's the one, the Winter Olympics? You know, the biathlon? Where they have to ski, ski, then what, then what do they do? They have to like shoot. They have to like steady, but they're shaking from adrenaline. So there's all these fun things that uh, athletes do in competition. But when I kind of know this stuff, it kind of makes it more interesting for me to watch it as a spectator. But anyway, getting back to the uh, research side. This is a picture of someone um, volunteering their uh, muscle fibers for biopsy. So you can run experiments because um, how we've kind of ascertained these fiber types is based upon identifying what they have in terms of the metabolic profile. And so what I want you to know is kind of how researchers do this. How do you determine fiber type? You can kind of guess.
we're like, well, why don't you just tell us? It's like, no, I want you to figure it out. Right? That's the whole point of being a student of physiology. How do they do it? And you biopsy, and then you stain for different things. One thing they stain for is myofibrillar ATPase. I'll call it M A T P A S for sure. Now, you study the muscle fiber. Remember the myofibrils? If you train the muscle fibers hypertrophy, do they increase the number of myofibrils? So when you're standing for this enzyme, and you're a strong muscle fiber, um, you would expect a high content of this enzyme. Okay. So if you got a lot of this, the cell will stain dark. Therefore, it's probably a 2B if it stains dark for. Does that make sense? Because it has a lot of it. And there's probably a range based on my explanation here. What, how do you think a type 1 would stain, light or dark? Light. You don't expect as much. So by comparison, this would stain light. So that, that's a clue. Oh, it stains dark for this. Maybe it's a type 2 something. All right, so then you have the succinic dehydrogenase. Um, well, basically, this is called an SDH for short. OK, but what it is, it's a mitochondrial enzyme. And so you kind of stain for mitochondrial enzymes when you're trying to identify a type 1. SDH is a mitochondrial So you'd expect the type 1s to stain the darkest, because this is for the aerobic metabolism. You'd expect the 2s to stain much lighter. So there, there'd be a range from light to dark in reverse for mitochondrial enzymes. It's a different property. Right? OK, well, um, the last one is glycolytic enzyme. I'm just going to put GE for short. The glycolytic enzymes, was that the aerobic or the anaerobic? That was the anaerobic. And which fiber types had those? The twos. So you'd expect the type twos to stain darker for the glycolytic enzymes, but then light for there. So basically, the two A's, they kind of stain medium to dark for everything, because they got everything. But you'd expect this kind of light, dark, light for the ones, and the dark, light, dark, well, you know, depending on what it is, right? You got, you got, uh, there's a lot of pictures in your book that kind of illustrate this. So what you got here, well, before we kind of look at these, are there any questions on what I did here? OK, let's put it to practice then. picture here. Um, okay, this is A N. That says A. You can hardly see it. A N A and I. So let me write that down. Let's make this half sheet number two. So for number two, they got A N. They got that dark A and I. Now before I pose what I want you to answer, what did they stain for? Here, I say at the top of the slide, what did they try to stain for? What does it say at the top? It says stain for anaerobic things. That's our, like our SDH. OK, so you're staining for aerobic things. It looks like the AN stained the lightest. And it looks like the A stained the darkest. And it looks like the I 
somewhere in between, say intermediate. So my question for you is, what's the fiber type for the A, N, the A, and the I? So go, answer it on your half sheet. I'll give you a minute. For those of you who are thinking too hard, the answer is on the bottom of the slide. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah, I'm not trying to trick you. But for those of you who were thinking about it, do you get it? Or are you just copying down the right answer? That doesn't do you any good. If you've got questions, let's hear it. Well, let me just go over it. What does the AAN stand for? Anaerobic. Anaerobic. Does that make sense that they stain lightest for the SDH and their type 2B? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the same thing I've been teaching. And the darkest one was for aerobic. the aerobic, the type 1s. And in, somewhere in between are the type 2As, because they have both. So sometimes they're called intermediate fibers for that reason. All right, well, uh, well, there's another slide there. It's the, let's, let's move on. Let's get away from this slide. Um, okay, this is a different one, different terminology. I won't have you do it on your half sheet. Again, the answer is right here. They use 1 to A to X. I've never seen 2X before, but they use it. Okay. And, it, and they stain for SDH. So it's an aerobic thing, and it looks like the type 1 stained darker, the 2A stain kind of dark, and the 2X stained the lightest. So it's the same trend. Okay, this is a little more sophisticated because they're actually looking at the fiber size plotted against SDH activity. So, and they tell you that the open circles type 1s. Okay, so don't even look at the data. Just, okay, think. Type 1. Okay. Let's see. They're aerobic. Uh, what about the fiber size? Are they diameter? Are they big? Are they small? Okay, so what you'd expect is because they're smaller, the open circles are, are closer to this end. They have the highest amount of SDAs, but it kind of like is the mid-level here. Their activity um, is kind of around there. The closed circles are the type 2As. They actually display a higher amount of SDH activity. Okay, And there, some of them are slightly bigger. Notice the ones that are slightly bigger have a lower SDH activity. So there's kind of a range. It kind of goes down this way. And that the trend is the type 2Bs are the largest and the strongest, but they have the lowest amount of SDH activity. I just wanted you to see the general trend there <coughs> about fiber types. This is how we classify them. And this leads to the size principle. Um, okay, this I want you to do on your half sheets, and it'll take more than a minute. I'll give you a couple of minutes. We're on number three, I think. So for number three, comment on for each fiber type, time to fatigue, the innervation ratio, the diameter, and the, uh, the cell body size of the neuron there. Fatigue, comment on that. Innervation ratio. Fiber. Diameter, neuron cell body size. I'll just say neuron size. For the ones, two A's, and the two B's. I'll, I'll just table this out.
go ahead and talk it out. These aren't quiz questions. These are so we can't ask your partner, oh, what's put for that? I can't remember. You just try to get it filled out for now. This is one. Get it filled out good. Take a picture of it because when you turn it in, you're not getting it back. It might be a good thing to study from. All right, I turn back in. I'm just going to survey the class a little bit. In terms of the fatigue, which type of fatigue the fastest? Two Bs did. In terms of innervation ratio, which one was the highest? Two B was. That means the one motor neuron innervated the most muscle fibers. Which one had the largest fiber diameter? To B did. They were the strongest, so the fibers were the biggest. In terms of the neuron cell body size, which one was the biggest? The 2B. They're the hardest to stimulate because their neurons are larger. It takes more of a voluntary effort to recruit them. Training, resistance training, uh, you improve the neural recruitment of the larger ones. I have a question. Yeah. And then what type is um, the fatigue the fastest? 2B. Okay. 2B fatigue okay. fastest. Okay. All right, moving on. Uh, I got to teach the size principle here. Let me just kind of. Uh, where's my pointer? The size principle of recruitment.
the size, principle of recruitment. Let me move to my slide. The motor unit recruitment is determined by the force required for a movement. Small, highly excitable motor neurons are recruited first and most frequently. That's kind of the first rule I wrote on the board today. Okay. Larger, less excitable motor units are recruited much later. So what we know now is that the ones recruited first are like the ones, type ones, and then the bigger ones that you don't use very much is, for example, the two Bs. And so it makes sense here. This says stimulus voltage. Okay, I guess in a person, it's your effort. How strong are you trying? Less of an effort because the load isn't very heavy. But as the load gets heavier and heavier and you gotta lift more and more, you try harder. Voluntary effort. And then what it shows you here in this middle frame, uh, basically you recruit more and more and more motor units. More muscle fibers are being stimulated as the load gets heavier. And of course you peak out at some point, right? And so if you recruit more motor units, the, the strength of contraction happens better. Okay, I mean you generate more force basically over time. So, let me just kind of give you an example of this. Um, let's say the, the weight you have to move is a small weight, just a couple of pounds. Knowing that, Maybe you just recruit a type one. Okay, and this type one maybe innervates a couple of muscle fibers. And these two fire, and basically, let's say that's enough to move the load. Okay, great. Let's say the load increases. Maybe it's 25 pounds. Well, you're going to have to put more of an effort to lift 25, pan, 25 pound bag of something, okay, whatever it is, a bag of rice or bigger load, basically. So what you do is, well, hmm. you recruit these first, recruit the type ones, but then you add on to that, what's the next type? 2A probably, right? And so the 2A is maybe their uh, cell body type is bigger. And maybe they innervate um, more muscle fibers. And the fibers are a little larger. maybe that's enough to move the load. But the point is you're recruiting more. But you didn't just jump straight to the two A's. You have to, you always recruit the ones first. You're just adding to it, okay? Uh, but let, let's say like you gotta move 100 pounds. And so you're gonna have to go through the whole gamut, right? More effort, so. What do you recruit first? One. Then what do you recruit second? Two A's. And then what do you recruit third? Two B's. And so maybe um, a type, this orange one is like my example of two A. So maybe a two B, I'll use a different color. Uh, they have the largest uh, cell body size. And they have the highest innervation ratio in the largest fibers. Okay, so I'll just kind of draw them innervating the most, basically.
maybe that's enough to move the 100 pounds. Maybe you haven't lifted a weight in decades and you don't even have two Bs. You can get someone else to lift it, right? We all should consider resistance training as a part of our lifestyle. Uh, when you lift weights, uh, we kind of went through it, but you improve recruitment if you resistance train. Okay, you just get better at recruiting these muscles. And every time you do it, the neural um, recruitment becomes better. Um, you develop the two A's and the two B's, you get stronger and all the benefits. It takes about a month. It takes about a month. Okay. I've that before. Okay, so here's basically what we just did. So if you need to generate more tension, because you have to lift a heavier load, if it's two pounds, you're down here. But if it's 25 pounds, you have to recruit more. And if it's 100 pounds, you, you have to recruit um, all of them to get the max tension. We're going to be doing a, a lab on Wednesday, the EMG lab, what I gave you the, the procedure for. And um, the EMG stand, it stands for electromyography. Okay. Electromyography, EMG for short, it's basically what this lab is. And well, there's a picture of the equipment, and it's pretty good, and pretty much what we have for you. We have these like black cases, and they're very sophisticated, and I just kind of put them out. And um, yeah, be very careful with our machines. We have laptops, so we don't have desktops for you. And there's going to be this blue box in it, that's the hardware. You just use a USB cable um, to connect to your laptop. And um, we're going to have some electrodes for you. Because what you could do is you could put skin surface electrodes on your lead. Okay, A lead is negative to positive, and there's a third lead for a ground. But basically, you're putting the lead across the anterior aspect of your forearm. So when you do that, you're going to assess the muscle strength of these muscles, which control grip. Okay? Because so when you because when you grip, that's this muscle activity, not this muscle activity. Okay. So we can monitor the electrical activity by putting the lead there. And so for example, like clenched fist data, four clenches, it's all about the subject. Um, you'll work in groups of four or five, and but only have one subject, okay? And then just say, okay, so clench, clench harder, clench even harder, and then the fourth clench is the hardest effort. So do you see why you have the largest signal? Because it's the hardest effort. And that's what you expect to see in a normal result. Clench this. Okay. Well, you know, we can actually be more sophisticated. Instead of just making a fist, we actually have you squeeze this um, force grip bar right there. Okay, that's how you grip it. And it can measure the kilograms of force. So instead of just seeing red noise, middle frame, What it can do is it can integrate this information and kind of make it the area under the curve thing, and it can estimate the force in kilograms. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the strongest people, 50. Okay, I'm like 30, kind of on small forearms. And um, one thing you could do when well, we're going to do it, we're going to take tape measure and we're going to measure your forearms. Okay. I got dinky forearms, so I'm like 30, but. People have bigger forearms, they're going to clench harder. Okay. We're also going to do the fatigue thing, right? Like you can clench really hard for a couple of seconds and you measure it. Say your max effort is 
50 kilograms. And the question becomes, how long can the subject maintain that 50 kilogram death grip squeeze? Not very long. After the first few seconds, you start to tire out, don't you? Okay. And so we kind of define fatigue as 50% of your max. If you determine max is 50, what's 50%? 25. So they, they don't know. Like they're just like squeezing, like they're kind of getting all red faced. You can cheer them off. Come on, longer, longer. Hold out. But all along, you guys are watching the data. Time's running. You, they start out at 50, but it drops off. See how it's dropping off there? When it gets, you know, to 25, oh, I guess they can stop their fatigue. The whole time they're giving a max effort, but once they drop to 25, they can stop. And the question, the question is, how long did that take? And what do you think? A minute? If you could go a minute, that's pretty good. Most people poop out after 30 seconds. Okay, but it depends on your, your will. <laughs> that's kind of weird. Time to fatigue. That, that's a fun one. Kind of thing. Uh, the other thing we have you do um, is length, tension, relationship. We talked about this last time. This is kind of how it comes into fruition when you grip. Now, the illustration has a different gripper, but the, the principle is the same. You put your wrist in different wrist positions. This one is supposed to be the strongest. Why? Look at the sarcomere. What did we say about this? What did we keep calling this on the last time we had talked about sarcomere length? We called it optimal. You put the muscle in the optimal length, you get the most force. That's what you're supposed to see. <coughs> Each time, you're given a max effort. But what you expect is if you flex and then max effort, it shouldn't be as strong as this one. Or if you kind of bend it all the way backwards, and give a max effort, you're stretching out the sarcoma a little bit, it shouldn't be a max effort either. So, I mean, that, that's the other thing you should see. But all the subject knows is, try your hardest, try your hardest, try your hardest. Okay. That'll be Wednesday. Uh, Alright, so that uh, concludes today's lecture. Since the lab is online, we'll just have early dismissal today. Yay. <laughs> so, um, I'll see you Wednesday. Turn your half sheets. Yeah, that actually simulates the lab. There's another one too in your book. There's nowhere to submit it. Oh, you asked me. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs>